Welcome back to our sessions. We have been talking about the relationship of theology to counseling, and we had just finished talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in the counseling process. In fact, it is the Holy Spirit that is necessary for the counselor to do his job. It's what qualifies that particular counselor to do his job. And now we, that brings us to the doctrine of the church or ecclesiology. Um, the church is the body of Christ. Uh, Jesus is the head of the church. Um, it's the place of worship. It's the place of sanctification. Um, therefore, from a counseling perspective, AA groups, uh, self-help groups, 12-step uh, programs, um, recovery groups are lame competition for the church. They are cheap substitute for the church. God never intended there to be all these separate type of organizations that people get involved in that um, uh, for the rest of their life and then recruit later on as part of the 12th step other members to get involved in that particular group. Now, I do not deny the fact that there are many of these 12 step programs and AA people that have helped people get off of their um, whatever substance that they were uh, enslaved to, uh, or the world uses the word addiction, um, uh, they have helped them to do that. But what it does is uh, the church has the capacity to be able to do the same thing, to work with very difficult substance abuse uh, people and help them with the right kind of encouragement, the right kind of accountability, um, and the right type of counsel from the word of God to walk free from that. Um, God never intended that to go to a separate organization or a separate group outside of the church. Um, the kind of change they want is, is, um, is different than what the Bible says our change should be. Uh, for example, I had a good friend of mine several years ago who was a very faithful pastor and a very wonderful biblical counselor. God has since promoted him to glory. But he used to say, he used to share an illustration about a woman who brought her 19-year-old uh, son to him for counseling, and the son had a terrible problem already at the age of 19 with alcohol. And he said, um, after one session, the woman decided, this is not what I want. So she took her son and put her son in an AA program. And my friend says he watched that process go on over a period of several months and years. And he said that that kid went into that AA program, a lying, cursing, wicked, and God dishonoring drunkard. And he came out the other side, a lying, cursing, uh, wicked, God dishonoring, sober guy. So it had, in a sense, gotten him off of his alcohol, but it not really substantively changed his, in, 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 his, um, his heart, his inter, internal life, internal life. And so as a result of that, this kid um, just went right back out into society. Um, he usually, people like that, substitute whatever they used to consume in terms of a substance with maybe being like a workaholic or uh, devoted to some kind of artistic expression. Um, so they just substitute one materialistic thing for another materialistic thing, rather than learning how to honor and serve God in their life. There's a big change between those two. There's a big difference between those two, uh, between biblical counseling and what goes on in 12-step programs. In the church, the saints are supposed to minister to one another through the word of God, seeking real change. And this is what um, Romans 15 or verse 14 says. Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. And that word instruct is the word nuthateo, which means to admonish or counsel or... Uh, warn or instruct in this particular case. And that's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. Um, the body of Christ is a place of worship. It's a place of sanctification. In other words, it's a place where we focus away from ourselves to God, attributing all glory and praise and honor to him, 
We no longer are the center of our own universes. God is the center of the universe, and he becomes the focus of our life. That's what worship does. Sanctification, then, is the process that God now takes the believer through in getting rid of sin as he walks in this sinful world with a sinful, uh, habituated body. Um, This is what we call, and we'll talk about this later in our class, progressive sanctification to become more like Christ and more holy. And notice this, the Bible also tells us that the church has authority. The right of discipline was not given to the family uh, in terms of church discipline or the state. Matthew chapter 18 makes it clear that this is something that the church should do. If someone's in sin, then, um, and another person sees that they are in sin, Uh, and they're struggling in a sin, they need to go and rebuke them gently and offer them help and counsel to get out of that sin. If that doesn't work, then they need to take two or three counselors or witnesses with them to help them resolve that issue. And if that doesn't work, then it needs to be taken to the church, first to the leadership or the elders of the church, and then later on to the church body as a whole. So... Therefore, counseling is done in the church. It's not in private practices. Sometimes we say this in biblical counseling. It's really church discipline that puts teeth into counseling. It shows that a church is very, very serious about expecting people who claim to be Christians to live according to the word of God. When a church doesn't practice church discipline, it's not serious about holiness. It's allowing a confusion to occur among its ranks. When it doesn't practice church discipline, it allows people who are persistently involved in sin to be a part of that church. I counseled a young woman several years ago, and this particular young woman came to me, and she was in a rather large church. It was supposedly a conservative, Bible-believing church. And um, she confessed in counseling the fact that she was teaching a rather a large church um, Sunday school class in that church of mostly young women in that class. But at the same time, she was living with her boyfriend who was not her husband. And I remember asking her, does your church know about this? Do the leadership of your church, are they aware that this is going on? And she said, oh yes, they're aware. Well, Do you realize that this is sin? You're in direct rebellion against God. Here they are. They're fully aware that you're practicing sin by living with your boyfriend and at the same time on Sunday trying to pretend to be a holy and righteous young lady teaching other young ladies how to live according to what the scriptures say when in reality you're not. And you know, she broke into tears and she melted at that particular point. She said, this is the guilt that I've been carrying for such a long time. And I said to her, you need to go back to that particular church and its leadership, and you need to say, I'm stepping out of this because I realize that I'm in sin. Um, It's you that should have removed me when you heard this, but I'm going to do this of my own volition. I'm pulling out of any kind of teaching. And then that next week, she moved away from her boyfriend, got a separate apartment, started living on her own, began to really clean up her life from a biblical perspective, And now, eventually, later on, God forgave her, cleansed her of her sin. She began to live guilt-free, brought along a wonderful Christian young man. They eventually got married and have a wonderful family. But that was a real critical turning point in her life. Church discipline is key to that. And here's a church who claimed to be a Bible-believing church and yet did not practice church discipline. They're not serious about holiness, and they're not serious about people who... Uh, claim to be Christians and yet continue to live an ungodly lifestyle. Uh, Our own president of our seminary several years ago authored a book that I've used quite often to lead people to Christ. It's called The Gospel According to Jesus by John MacArthur. That particular book is a tremendous book because that basically sets out the thesis or the premise that um, a person who claims Jesus Christ as Savior And Lord cannot go out and live an ungodly lifestyle um, indefinitely and expect 
to go to heaven. They can't do that. Um, because they're showing that they were never really substantively or truly changed internally. There has to be a substantive change. First John talks about that. You cannot continue in sin and the truth be in you. You can't do that. Um, so it's a church that practices church discipline that takes these counseling issues very, very seriously. Now, this brings us also to the doctrine of eschatology, which is the doctrine of end times. I love this because as a biblical counselor, there are not any other counseling systems in the world that has, that has this kind of hope. Um, uh, Christ rules. That's really key. He has all authority. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 is very clear about that. So take your Bible. Let's go over there for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Here, the writer of Hebrews um, talks about the Lord Jesus Christ and picking up in verse two, it says, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he created the world. In this particular case, it's not referring to in the Greek language, uh, the word there for world is not cosmos, which this material world, but it's Ionos, which means he created the ages. That's the idea through whom he created the ages. He is the radiance um, of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So you get this idea that um, Jesus Christ rules all. He has all authority. He controls all of history. Therefore, humble dependence upon him through prayer and through the word of God is necessary. And it's a critical part of counseling. Uh, if not, it's not Christian counseling. Um, as John 15 and verse 5 says, without him, we can do nothing, nothing. Um, so that means in the counseling process, there's never a situation he can't change if he wills. Never a situation he can't change. Uh, no matter what comes along, no matter how complicated or complex or difficult that trial may be or the situation may be, I don't care how hard the conundrum may be, Christ has the answer. He has the answer to it. I may not know that answer as a counselor. You may not know it as a counselor, but you need to work with your counselee with the word of God in order to find that answer, to clearly establish that from scripture. That's really critical. So there's never anything that he can't change if he wills. It also tells us that the second coming of Christ gives us hope for the future. He is coming. Uh, what other counseling system has that kind of hope? No, no other counseling system knows the future. And if they say that they know the future, uh, they're lying to you. I know that there are a lot of psychological tests that try to predict whether or not a young man or woman is going to grow up to be a, uh, a mass murderer. Uh, that supposedly was uh, the, the purpose of the Roy shock um, ink blot tests, they were supposed to be able to reveal uh, who were future um, potential criminals, have difficulty in their life, when in reality, it's a very, very um, unscientific approach. It's it, 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 the interpretive process to interpret the answers given on those ink blot tests are incredibly subjective. Um, it's not scientific at all and oftentimes is wrong. It depends on the psychotherapist. I don't care how many degrees he has or she has in, in that particular process. It depends on the psychotherapist and the interpretation that they bring to it that supposedly yields some kind of result. Well, when any kind of psychotherapeutic system pretends in some way to predict the future, it doesn't know the future. But God in his goodness has kind of lifted the veil of history uh, 
and allowed us to peek into the future in order to know what the future holds, to know that he himself controls the future and what's going to happen. And eventually, he has a plan to bring everything around so that all righteousness is served, all injustice is somehow punished in the future. All of that, all of history is heading to that climactic time. This is um, something that's reflected when the Bible talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ, which gives hope for the future. Uh, in other words, there will be total justice someday, both for the church as well as the individual. Total justice someday. Um, so, uh, as counselors and as counselees, we don't lose heart uh, because we're not going to suffer forever. Not at all. Um, while your Bible is turned over to Hebrews, go over one chapter, just to the right, to the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 12. Notice what James says here. He says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. What a great promise. Now, what counseling system can offer that kind of hope to a counselee? Um, only a biblical one. Um, or let's go over to 1 Peter. Uh, just go over one more book. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Uh, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now, there is hope that we have for the future. In fact, if you go over one more chapter to chapter 5, and we're interested um, in verse 10, he says, and after you have suffered a little while, and my counselees always want to know what a little while is, well, compared to the duration of this trial, it's going to be a little while. I, he says, after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Oftentimes, I'll take time and talk about each one of those key words. What does restoration mean? What does confirmation mean? What does strengthening mean? What is establishing you mean? Um, but during the trial, you certainly don't feel like you're restored or confirmed. You feel weak. You feel unstable instead of established. That's what happens during trials. But it's through that trial that God, in a sense, strengthens you. Um, it's much the same way that a person who trains to run a marathon, they don't just go out and decide they're going to run a 26-mile marathon um, the day after they decided to run one. No, they have to go through training. Why, why are they doing that? Because they're strengthening, they're building up their body, they're increasing their lung capacity to be able to withstand all the difficulty and that's going to be in running that 26-mile marathon. Um, uh, and so God will take us as well through difficult trials, hardships, um, in order to strengthen us and establish us and confirm us um, and restore us as well. All of those things are really, really key. So as believers then, we don't lose heart. We don't lose heart. Um, now, take your Bible again. Um, let's go back to that passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we're interested in verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, where Paul talks about that in his run uh, of the race of the Christian life. Um, he says, um, picking up in verse 16, he says, so we do not lose heart, uh, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension 
as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Now, that's what we look to. And when it comes to the whole issue of ecclesiology, that's really critical that we, um, we keep our eyes, or I should say eschatology, uh, the doctrine of last things, that we keep our eyes on the future, the fact that God says that he is going to right all wrongs, the fact that there is hope for the future, that he will also, in the process of going through the present day trials, um, restore us and confirm us and strengthen us and establish us. All of that is going to happen now as we focus on the things that are not seen. In other words, sometimes I'll say to my counselees, we have to anchor our souls in heaven where things don't change, even though everything in my life right now is changing. And sometimes circumstances will do that. And God will allow circumstances to be like a bulldozer that comes into a person's life and completely rearrange the entire landscape of that person's life. It changes everything in their life. They're devastated as a result of that, or they've suffered some kind of traumatic loss. God says that um, he will eventually restore them, confirm them, strengthen them, establish them, even though at that particular time, it's very traumatic. They have to keep their eye on things that are not seen instead of the things that are seen, because these things that are seen are just momentary afflictions, but they are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comprehension, beyond all of our imagination, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Because the things that are seen, as Solomon so aptly said, are transitory. They're transient. Uh, Solomon uses the term there in Ecclesiastes chapter one. He says, vanity of vanity, it's all vanity. Or the Hebrew is haval havalim, haval havalim, smoke, smoke, uh, it's all smoke. Or sometimes I like the illustration, so bubbles, so bubbles, everything that's a part of this world is so bubbles, it looks pretty for a short amount of time, and you say, oh, isn't that wonderful? And then it pop, it's gone, and it's gone forever. Your youthfulness is a part of this world that is passing away. The people around you are passing away. You're passing away eventually. We're all transient in this world, but we fix our, our focus as Christians on eternal things. That's really critical. That's where genuine eschatology takes over. So we have to give our, our counselees that kind of hope. Now, this brings us to theological problems with some Christian counseling books. If you go to a local Christian bookstore, if you go online and look for Christian books, there are a whole host of Christian books that are out there. And um, Christian publishing is a great blessing to the church in many cases, but sometimes broad Christian publishing is also one of the greatest curses of the Christian church because it sometimes spreads as much error as it does truth. Um, so it's important to get good biblically sound Christian books published because the majority of the books that are out there, especially in the Christian counseling realm are terrible books. And for example, let me give you some reasons why. Um, one is there's an absence of the role and the work of the Holy spirit in, um, in a lot of those books. Um, and that's because Really, they're taking a secular theory usually and importing it into the Christian domain and then hanging a few Bible verses on the external limbs of that in order to make it look good and make it look and sound Christian, but it's really not Christian at all. The very structure of it is um, from a secular psychotherapeutic theory. So, and there's the absence of the work of the Holy Spirit because all the secular theories have one thing in common, and that is they're all materialists. Um, they may incorporate Eastern religions into them, but most secular theories only incorporate those because of therapeutic value, not because they really believe in any kind of God. Um, 
so uh, they're, they're basically materialists. And, and, and now we try to make that harmonize, that particular secular theory with what's going on in Scripture, and it doesn't work, and especially the role of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is critical, as we have seen in the past, to transform a person, to bring about real substantive heart level change. You cannot get any deeper of a change in a person than the role of the Holy Spirit. And most Christian counseling books either one of two extremes, either the Holy Spirit's work is totally absent in, in those books, or there is an extreme view, clear to the other view, where it's a very mystical view of the Holy Spirit that expects the Holy Spirit to do things that God commands us to do. Um, so you have one of those two extremes going on in Christianity. Um, so there's oftentimes an absence of the work of the Holy Spirit. Um, Secondly, oftentimes in a lot of those Christian books, there's a neglect of the church. Um, and what we mean by that is they, they don't see the value of the church. The church is not really critical to the entire counseling process. For biblical counseling, the church is vital. Um, as we've talked recently, we've talked about the importance of church discipline because it's church discipline that puts teeth into counseling. That's really critical. Um, and it is the church that was intended that God established as his institution to oversee the doctrinal integrity of what happens in its teaching and especially its counseling. Uh, that's one of the problems in a lot of counseling that even goes on underneath some churches. The leadership of that church doesn't oversee the doctrinal integrity of that. And that's the responsibility of the leadership, the elders of the church to do so. Also, in a lot of Christian books, there's a lack of emphasis on prayer. Um, Thomas Watson, that great Puritan, used to say, beggars beg. That's really key. Beggars beg. Um, when a person has a contrite and broken spirit and is truly humbly dependent upon Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when a person is poor in spirit, they are a beggar. Then they will pray. There is a oftentimes in a lot of Christian literature, an absence of genuine, fervent prayer. In my counseling, uh, we pray at the beginning of counseling. We may pray in the middle of counseling and stop and pray at a, at a spot. We always pray at the very end of our counseling session. I pray between the counseling sessions. Sometimes I'll have counselees in between our counseling sessions call me, and I'll have pray, prayer with them. So from the very beginning, in the middle, at the end of that entire counseling process, it is totally bathed in prayer. And oftentimes I'll ask my counselees to pray, not only is it important to get them into the habit of turning to God for help, um, and that's critical for them, but it also reveals a lot of good information to you as a counselor because people will often pray for what they wish for or want the most. And so that provides a lot of information for you. Sometimes their prayers are incorrect and you need to help them. But most Christian counseling books out there... Um, their pride is revealed in their prayerlessness. Um, we don't place an emphasis on prayer. There's a dependence upon self. There's a dependence upon self-effort. Um, um, and there's no acknowledgement of the fact that if I'm really going to change, I have to be dependent upon God and what God is doing and upon his word and upon the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. As 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says we need to pray without ceasing. In addition, a lot of counseling books out there, there is no commitment to the sufficiency of Scripture. If there is in some counseling books, they redefine sufficiency. They'll say something like this, and you have to be very, very careful of counseling training that claims to be biblical counseling, and yet they'll say, well, the Scripture is sufficient in, in so much as what it speaks to. And what they mean by that is that... Scripture is sufficient to speak to things like salvation uh, as if the Bible really basically is a roadmap to get us to heaven. But beyond that, it really doesn't teach us how to deal with the real difficult issues of life, but it at least it helps us get to heaven. So it's sufficient 
in helping us get to heaven. But in every other matter, like if you're dealing with severe depression, or if you're dealing with the issue of schizophrenia, or if you're dealing with the issue of kind of bipolar type behavior, uh, the Bible really doesn't speak to that. In fact, you can look up in the back of your concordance of your Bible, and you're not going to find those terms. Well, just because the Bible doesn't use those modern psychotherapeutic terms does not mean it doesn't speak to those particular issues. In fact, I want to suggest to you that it speaks to those issues more thoroughly than any psychotherapeutic approach does today, much more thoroughly and much more fundamentally than any psychotherapeutic approach. That's really critical. So there's no commitment to sufficiency of Scripture. Um, and, and the way you can tell this, by the way, also is the fact that they'll talk about, well, you need this plus, you need the Scriptures plus this and this and this and this. In other words, the Scripture has to be supplemented. It's almost like uh, the Scripture drips with a few counseling truths, but we need to turn on the fire hose of psychotherapy to really help us deal with the complex issue of modern life. That implies that somehow God ill-equipped the Scriptures. That violates Second uh, Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, um, where he has given us everything we need for life and godliness through a knowledge of him. That's really critical. So to add Scripture... Um, to something that's um, psychotherapeutic or secular is to subtract God. Um, uh, what God has said is really being sufficient for life and godliness. Um, we don't need this plus something else. We need more of something, and that is the scriptures. That's really key. We need more of the scriptures. Our counseling approach has got to come completely from what scripture says from beginning to end and even procedurally the way we think about problems has got to come from a biblically informed mindset a lot of counseling books out there as well says um, kind of rename sin and the omitting of sorrow and repentance um, uh, they call it a sickness they'll call it a disorder um Really, oftentimes, what is referred to as a disorder in contemporary psychotherapy is just a cluster of symptoms. That's all it is. The disorder is a cluster of symptoms. But if you take a look at the symptoms that it's describing, then you'll find that the Bible speaks to those symptoms. For example, take obsessive compulsive disorder. When you take a look at the cluster of symptoms that the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the APA, the American Psychological Association, says about OCD or obsessive compulsive disorder, you begin to find out that the root of this is a lot of fear, a lot of fear. And I've worked with many people who were perfectionistic who were leaning towards OCD and then those who were had been labeled completely as severe cases of OCD and once you begin to work on a heart level with their fundamental fears that the Bible addresses then all of a sudden those behaviors and uh, those thinkings and those habitual almost unconscious responses start to fade away they start to recede at that particular point when they see this as a real problem in their heart, it's based upon a false assumption that's an ungodly one and therefore a sinful one that needs repentance, then change occurs and the Holy Spirit uses that change in their life. So um, a person is not an alcoholic. The world's going to call it an alcoholic. No, the Bible calls that a drunkard. Alcoholism and that term makes it sound like it's a disease and there is no disease, there's no uh, pathogen that's ever been proven to be affecting or triggering alcoholism. Um, the world will talk about peer pressure. Uh, that's a term that is used quite frequently. Well, the Bible talks about the fact that that's the fear of man. Peer pressure is the fear of man. Um, or sometimes uh, closely associated to that is what the world will call, um, especially somebody, for example, that you have that's married to a, um, a drunkard, um, and they will lie for their husband, um, or they'll do things to kind of compensate for their drunken, drunkenness. Um, uh, a person like that, uh, for example, when um, 
the boss calls in the morning and the husband is uh, laying in bed, sound asleep because he's got a hangover. And the wife lies for her husband by telling his boss, um, um, he's sick today. He's not going to be able to come into work. Well, she's lying. That's not really true. He doesn't have any kind of a disease. He's lying in bed because he drank too much alcohol the night before, and now he's sleeping that off. Um, that's what the world calls a person who's codependent. Uh, the Bible says that a person who's codependent is a person who is plagued with a similar problem with the fear of man. So there are numerous things that the world uses as labels to describe a cluster of symptoms that oftentimes are referred to as syndromes or disorders or even diseases in this particular case. And all they are is just a cluster of symptoms. Um, think about them from a biblical standpoint. In addition to this, there are man, a lot of uh, Christian counseling books are very man-centered. In other words, it's all about man and how he feels. It's very feeling-oriented or very needs-driven. What man needs or what he feels he needs, felt needs in this particular case, um, rather than being focused on God's word, rather than pleasing God, rather than glorifying him, as 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, we must discipline our lives for the purpose of godliness. That's really critical. And then a lot of the counseling books that are Christian out there also use psychological terminology. They use psychological terminology. And Apostle Paul, we already saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, says, We do not speak with words taught by human wisdom, but by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. All of that is really, really critical. So there's a major problem with a lot of Christian counseling books that are out there. You have to be very, very careful uh, about those particular books. In our next session, now we'll uh, make a transition and we'll begin to talk more specifically about physical and spiritual aspects of counseling.